Hi, everyone. This is Rabbi Yaakov Wolby. And before we begin uh, this podcast, I want to share with you a quick message. I started recording my Torah classes in podcast form in early 2013. Basically, I just took my phone and recorded and uploaded my Torah class that I was anyhow giving in my capacity as Outreach Director of Torch and put them online. Uh, since then, it's been remarkable. I branched out into four separate podcast channels, one in Jewish philosophy, this Jewish life, the Jewish history podcast, the Parsha podcast, the Torah 101 podcast, and intellectuals introduction to Torah. And of course, links to those podcast feeds are found in the description of every podcast. And over the years, I've seen remarkable success in spreading Torah using this medium. And frankly, it's been quite humbling. All four podcast channels have been featured on the iTunes Top 10 Jewish Podcasts Worldwide. And in fact, two of them actually spent time on the number one overall slot worldwide on iTunes for the category of Judaism. So it's been fantastic. And all told, I've uploaded more than 400 individual podcasts in 2016. For example, we did 121 podcasts that were downloaded more than 53,000 times. And as of today, today's March 22nd, we already uploaded 37 podcasts in 2017. And the rate of downloads is more than double of last year. So that's been remarkably gratifying for me. Uh, Particularly wonderful is when people from all across the globe email me and tell me how much they enjoy the classes. And as always, you can always email me, RabbiWalby at gmail.com. Now today, I have a favor to ask of you. I work for a Jewish outreach organization in Houston called Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston, uh, whose mission is to connect Jews and Judaism. And they, they pay the bills to allow me the astonishing amount of time needed to prepare and deliver these classes and these podcasts. And these podcasts are just a small part of the Torch's operations. We have hundreds of educational events annually. We have social events. We have a Jewish outreach center in Houston. We send students to Israel. And we do an annual once a year, online fundraiser at givetorch.com. Now, my request from you is, if you enjoy the podcasts and want to support our work, please go to givetorch.com and donate to the cause. This is a a once-in-a-year appeal. If you're interested in giving, please just pause the podcast, go right now, and make a donation to our campaign. And please email me, let me know that you support the podcast and our efforts. Again, the website is givetorch.com. And as always, thanks for downloading, thanks for listening, and enjoy. The objective of tonight's talk is to address a giant untruth perpetrated by the Christians. They profess to be a religion of love. Tonight, I want to talk about the history of Christian anti-Semitism and to demonstrate that their behavior has not been one of, of love, rather of hatred and cruelty towards us. And there's three things I want to hit. Number one, I want to understand the deep roots of anti-Semitism in Christian history and also to understand the rationale why Christians, so to speak, almost have to be anti-Semitic. Number two, I wanted to get a sense of the scope and intensity of Christian anti-Semitism. So we're going to run through a highly abridged account of the many merciless atrocities committed against the Jews by the Christians in the name of their religion. And lastly, I want to understand and explore the current state of affairs and the changing nature of Christian anti-Semitism in the United States and in Israel and in the whole world. Now, this is going to be a two-part series. Truthfully, it's a disclaimer before we start. It's a highly truncated version of the real events. Uh, To capture the true extent of Christian anti-Semitism throughout the ages would take a lot longer than one or two sittings. We might have to be here for a whole year or for a decade to really get the whole sense of all the atrocities perpetrated against us. So it's important for us to recognize that. Uh, Also, I think there's a grave danger that I'm I'm very wary of, and that is that we're going to be discussing an overwhelming volume of carnage, of tragic slaughter, and I'm worried that there's the risk that we could get desensitized to the brutality of these heinous crimes. 
Uh, we talk about a whole ton of Jews getting expelled or, God forbid, getting killed. We have to keep in mind that these are real people who had parents and spouses and children and jobs and lives and personalities and ambitions and backgrounds, hopes for the future, concern. Like They were people like us. And when we talk about a big picture, it's important for us to not lose sense of the individual human toll of what we're going to describe. These people, their lives were upended. Many, many of them were, their lives were tragically ended by violent anti-Semitism, and we cannot lose sight of that by trying to look at the big picture. I want to begin by understanding the background to the discussion. It seems to me that Christian anti-Semitism was inevitable. Uh, And indeed, you go back to the earliest records of the Christian fathers, it's very clear that the Christian fathers were unabashedly Jew-hating. The formative teachers and codifiers of Christian philosophy, the codifiers of Christian doctrine, uh, they uh, formed the Christian attitudes towards Jews. And from right away, from the very beginning, it was virulently anti-Semitic. Uh, in regular ongoing sermons and writings, the Jews were repeatedly tainted as heretics, as being greedy, shameless, rapacious, blasphemers, non-believers, murderers of JC and Christians, people who are bound for hell and eternal damnation, people that ought to be punished and are being punished for their <laughs> sins. There's an entire book written on the early Christian fathers and their uh, anti-Semitic views. I want to take a few choice quotes that I think capture the sentiment of the hatred demonstrated by the early church fathers. This is from St. Gregory, quote, Jews are murderers of the Lord, assassins of the prophet, rebels against God, God God-haters, advocates of the devil, race of vipers, slanderers, dark-minded people, leaven of the Pharisees, Sanhedrin of demons, sinners, Wicked men, stoners, and haters of the righteous. Seems pretty uh, clear what their position on this issue is. Uh, St. Jerome, he was the one who actually wrote the uh, definitive translation of the Bible. He succinctly summed his attitude towards the Jews, quote, I loathe the Jews with unfathomable hatred. So much for a religion of love. Now, it's important for us to note that this is not just anti-Jewish rhetoric. The church promulgated anti-Jewish legislation. They induced and encouraged encouraged riots and expulsions and synagogue be- uh, burnings all the way from the beginning. So, of course, we're going to spend the majority of our time talking about what happened in the Middle Ages and the medieval times and beyond. But even early on, right at the introduction of Christianity to the Roman Empire, we do see that the church and its leaders actively, directly and indirectly cause not just rhetorical harm, but actual harm to the Jews of their locales. Uh, So, for example, in Egypt, St. Sorel became the uh, Patriarch of Alexandria right away. He initiated a series of measures against Christian heretics, of course, including Jews, So he personally whipped up a frenzied mob that uh, caused the Jews of the town to flee. Synagogues were burned. Jewish homes, Jewish businesses were torn down and pillaged. Uh, In Italy, famous episode happened in Italy. There was a bishop who oversaw the burning of a synagogue. And the Roman emperor, Theodosius, he ruled that the people that did the damage against citizens had to pay and rebuild the temple. And St. Ambrose, who was one of the founders of Christian doctrine, uh, he defended them and he wrote in a famous letter to the emperor, there's no adequate cause for the people to be punished for burning down of the building, much less since it's the burning of a synagogue, a home of unbelief, a house of impiety, a receptacle of folly, which God himself has condemned. Uh, That's several examples, but there's also state-sponsored laws, legislation that stem from the church against 
the Jews. And it's clear that while the secular Roman authorities are the ones that implemented it, it actually, it actually stemmed from, actually, the root of it is from the Catholic Church. So just to give a quick sampling of actual laws as part of the Roman Empire that uh, were deeply anti-Semitic uh, during this early phase of Christian anti-Semitism. In 363, Jews, uh, Christians were not allowed to accept gifts from Jews, nor to celebrate feasts with Jews. Uh, in a little bit later on, the Codex Theodicinius, it's a, essentially a compilation of laws. Uh, Jews were not allowed to marry Christians. Jews were not allowed to have multiple wives. In 418, Jews were not able to testify against Christians. Jews were not allowed to join the military. Jews were forced to observe Christian holidays. Jews were not allowed to convert Christians to Jewry. Doing so would result in them being burned alive. Uh, later on, in the Bishop Council of 517, Jews were not allowed to eat at the same table with Christians. So we see right from the very beginning, um, before really the high point uh, or the low point of Christian anti-Semitism in the most recent millennium, we already see heavy Christian anti-Semitism. And the question is why? And it's clear to me, and I mentioned this earlier, that the Jew hatred is a fundamental theological principle of the Christian faith. The idea behind Christianity is that Judaism and the Jews being the chosen people and the divinity of the Torah is not being questioned. Yeah, they are willing to accept the Jewish people had a Torah and we had a mandate from God to change the world, but we messed up, we didn't accept JC, and we lost it. And the Old Testament was scrapped away and we have a new one. It's been upgraded, and the last one has been thrown away. But they faced a massive problem with their theology because the Jews are enduring. And the continued endurance and existence of the Jews, even after they're supposed to be discarded from their role in history, presented a major problem. So St. Augustine, in a very early Christian theologian, he devised a solution And the solution was that the role of the Jews is to continually exist and to be tormented because we rejected JC. And thus, we should be living testimony to what happens to people who reject Christianity. And the quote that he wrote, the humiliation and degradation of the Jews is precisely the evidence to their falsehood and to our Christian truth. Thus, hatred of Jews is in fact testimony all the way going back to the early development of Christian doctrine for the truth of Christianity. And thus, the more Jews are marginalized, the greater evidence they have that they're right. And thus, us being punished is actually proof and evidence for the the veracity of their religion. So it's ironic here. A religion that claims to be one of love, it actually depends upon the hatred of others to be evidence for the truth of their religion. Now, of course, the Jews never accepted the absurd notion that some Jew who lived 2,000 years ago is is God. It's, it was insane to us then. It's still insane to us now. And the Christians never forgave us, and they chose to torment us as a result. But I want to, before we really get into the you know, nitty-gritty here, and the meat and potatoes uh, of the discussion, we have to stress this point again and again. Jew hatred is a fundamental, necessary, inextricable tenet of Christian theology from the very beginning. And once we understand that, we could understand the sad course of the history of Christian anti-Semitism uh, more clearly. So, for example, if you need the Jews to suffer in order to support your belief in your own religion, is it a shock that you may turn a blind eye and not grieve too much when there's a Holocaust that's trying to eradicate the Jews? Why, why would you? Why would you mourn over that? Why would you try to stop that when the more grievous and the more heinous and the more complete the destruction of the Jews, the more you have to hang your own religious hat on? This this is actually emboldening the Christian claim. So why would they 
try to stop that. Now, I think also it's important to look at this from the Jewish sources. According to the Jewish sources, we look at Christianity as an extension of Edom, which is Esau, Esau, Jacob's twin. And thus, if you look at the development of Jacob and Esau, Yaakov and Esau, the conflict between Judaism and Christianity goes all the way back to Jacob and Esau in utero. And it's clear, you look at the sources in Genesis, that this conflict is, again, unavoidable. So, for example, when Rebecca is, uh, she is in gestation and there's a lot of chaos internally, she goes to speak to the prophet and the prophet tells her in Genesis chapter 25, two nations in your womb, two regimes for your inners, they'll go their separate ways. Uh, the might shall pass from one regime to the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. So this critical line, the might shall pass from one regime to the other. Rashi tells us, Rashi quotes the Talmud, that Jacob and Esau will never be equal in power. When one rises, the other inevitably falls. So indeed, the Christians are right. Our prominence is indeed undermining theirs. And the way it's told elsewhere in Jewish sources, two kings cannot use the same crown. We cannot have two nations that claim to be the people of God and the ones with the mandate to change the world at the same time. You only have one king with one crown. Indeed, if you look a little later on in Genesis, when Jacob and Esau meet again after Jacob has his whole family, the, is, there is the uh, reunification of the two, and Esau, uh, he hugs and he kisses his brother. When you look at a Torah scroll, and in, indeed in a Chumash, you'll notice there's a bunch of dots <clears throat> on top of the words, and he kissed him. And the question is, what do those dots mean? Typically, when the Torah has dots on top of, on top of a word, it's, it's used to minimize the effect of that word. So Rashi brings two opinions as to what this means. One opinion is, is that Jake, Esau really hated Jacob, and when he kissed him, it wasn't with the full enthusiasm. It wasn't entirely out of love. It wasn't a complete heart. That's one opinion. Another opinion Rashi brings, and this is a famous line, uh, he quotes, it's a halacha, it's a, a, a principle, an immutable principle of Torah that Esau hates Jacob, However, in this particular instance, his emotional love temporarily overcame his hatred. But it's interesting. Regardless, both opinions agree that under normal conditions, Esau is going to hate Jacob. The only argument is whether in that particular event, when they met after 20 years of being separated, was that hug and kiss, was that done out of full love or not? But either way, everyone agrees that under normal conditions, there exists fundamental hatred between Jacob and Esau. And importantly, another third element of this is that the, how do you deal with this hatred? What's the methodology of mediating this conflict? So we're told again uh, that Jacob, when, when Jacob usurps the blessing uh, intended for Esau, uh, Isaac famously says, Yedayim a day Esau, the kol kol Yaakov, the voice is the voice of Jacob, and the hands are the hands of Esau. Our methodology of conflict re- resolution is that we use our voice, we use reason, we use peaceful methods and civil ways of engaging with other people. Unfortunately, Esau, he uses his hands and thus violence. And indeed, the last thousand years of Jewish history living under Christian rule has been an unending string of the hands are the hands of Esau, violent anti-Semitism coming from the Christians. And indeed, over this past thousand years, Jews have been defenseless. They're living in Christian lands, and frequently they're granted no security whatsoever from the Christian rulers. Now, to be fair, there were some Gentiles over the course of history, the righteous Gentiles, who protected the Jews from the mobs, from the massacres, pogroms, crusades, blood libels, and all manner of persecution. But much more frequently, it was the leaders themselves who would manipulate and spur and encourage their followers to attack the Jews. And indeed, they had motivation to do that, aside from religious motivation, 
because those people, those serfs, those uneducated masses themselves were being persecuted by their overlords. And how do you get your constituency to not rile up against you and attack you? Well, give them a villain. Give the persecuted someone to persecute themselves, and thus the pent-up religious, political, and economic frustration of the people can all be let out on the Jews to pillage, to loot, and unfortunately to kill the Jews. And of course, they have... uh, a long list of excuses why they would do that. Namely, the Jews are stubborn, they're not accepting their God. The Jews are to blame for the non-return of their hero, etc. So I want to go through kind of some of the general themes uh, throughout uh, history, events of this nature. I want to begin, of course, with the Crusades. Crusades was the first large-scale event of Christian Semitism of the past millennium. And we've spoken about it previously in the year 1096, Pope Urban II makes a clarion call to all the Christians ostensibly to go reconquer Jerusalem from the infidels. Uh, he promises everyone who joins, they get, uh, first of all, all their sins are forgiven, and of course they could have a huge share of the booty. A huge force of knights and other soldiers and peasants are amassed. And along the way, they figure, hey, we're traveling all the way, all from all across Europe to Israel. Why don't we take care of some infidels along the way? And unfortunately, they massacred and pillaged Jewish communities. The three major towns of the Rhineland, uh, Spire, uh, known as Shapira, uh, Vermiza, Worms, and Mines, were all destroyed. And they began another practice that would be uh, that would be part of their mo- modus operandi of the next thousand years, forced baptisms. They finally got to Jerusalem. They managed to conquer it. How do you celebrate such a victory? You herd all the Jews of Jerusalem into the synagogue. You burn it down, and thereby they destroy the Jewish population of Jerusalem. All told, the First Crusade resulted in the murder of somewhere between ten and 25,000 Jews. And like we said, it was the first event of this scale uh, that's going to really essentially kick off, it's going to open the floodgates for a whole millennium of Christian persecution and anti-Semitism. I want to quote for you something found in the Talmud, in the Tosfos, commentary on the Talmud from this era. They lived in France and Germany during this time. And there's a very famous teaching in the book of Kedushin where the Talmud tells us that a father is not allowed to marry off his daughter while the daughter is still a minor. Even though technically he is legally allowed to, he's not, he's encouraged not to. And the Tosfos has a famous statement, and he says, nowadays, we do marry off our daughters when they're even, even when they're minors, because every single day, the exile gets stronger and stronger. And if someone has the capacity to marry off his daughter, and then she, to give her a, a respectable dowry, and get her married off, he should do it right away because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know if there's going to be a mob, a swarm of people that are going to take you. You don't know what's going to happen. Your life is not at ease. You can never be sure in the security of your current status. If you need to do something, don't delay. Do it right away. Now, throughout Christian Europe, Jews would be subject to centuries of torment and persecution. And frequently in various different countries, after many centuries of persecution, it's going to end with expulsion. Uh, I want to begin with England. England has the anonymous distinction of inventing a particularly fiendish form of anti-Semitism that became very popular, and that is the blood libel. In 1144, uh, the Jews of the city of Norwich were accused of the ritual murder of a young boy, they found him dead, and they made a claim that there's this international council of Jews that every year, in order to usher in the Mashiach, the Jews say we have to kill at least one Christian, crucify him, and drain their blood. And this particular year, they chose England, and the community of Norwich was tasked with that responsibility, and that's why they abducted and crucified this poor little boy. And of course, once they made that claim... It was totally eaten up by the populace, and as a result 
of these blood libels, uh, there were massacres of Jews in the various locales. So that happened in England in 1144, repeated in 1168, 1181, 1183, 1189, 11, in 1255, a Christian boy fell into a well and he disappeared. So what happens when there's a kid missing? You don't do an amber alert, you do a blood libel alert. It must be the Jews took him and drained his blood and used there for their demonic practices. And unfortunately, a hundred Jews were massacred and slaughtered before they actually found the kid who fell into the well. Um, this lie, of course, that Jews committed ritual murder or that um, Jews poisoned wells or Jews perpetrated plagues, essentially whatever's wrong with your life, you could just blame it on the Jews. Over the course of the sad history of the blood libels, uh, the idea that Jews used Christian blood for religious purposes took on various different forms. What do we need the blood for? So, whatever you could come up with, people will buy it if they're inclined to buy it anyhow. Big one, of course, was baking matzahs. A critical ingredient, allegedly, for baking matzahs is the blood of the Christians. Of course, we're not allowed to eat blood. And we don't even want to eat blood. And the whole thing's nonsense, but who cares? You, you, you say an idea, and what, what do you do after you perfect, find any dead child? You torture a local Jew. They, quote-unquote, admit their sin. And then you have a rampage of unthinkable atrocities as a result. Now, frequently, the, the reason, the motivation for this would be you have a debt. Jews were very frequently moneylenders. And... You borrow money from the Jew at a high interest rate and can't pay it back. What do you do? You want to cause a diversion. You cause a diversion. You take a local Christian kid. You kill him yourself. You blame him on the Jews. And then, in the frenzy, you go after the money lender and you kill him. And who's going to come claim the debt? You're free, Scott free. And this became very prevalent throughout Europe. Uh, and there's hundreds of thousands of Jews throughout history that were massacred in events like this. By the time, you know, we're, hopefully we'll get to uh, the year 1500 by the time we're done today, but there were already 50 such instances throughout Europe, and indeed it continued even, even beyond that. Uh, today, in Arab media, the notion of Jews consuming the bloods of non-Jews is still widely, uh, widely disseminated. In 2014, a Hamas representative in Lebanon uh, said on the Al-Quds TV channel, quote, We all remember how the Jews used to slaughter Christians in order to mix their blood into their holy matzahs. This is not a figment of imagination or something taken from a film. It is a fact acknowledged by their own books and by historical evidence. Of course, it's absolute nonsense. But even today, this is 2014, this, these, this nonsense is being perpetrated. So that's the beginning of Jewish life in England, and it got pro- progressively worse. Uh, so, for example, the Magna Carta in 1215, ostensibly a document of freedom and liberation, in it has a clause that any debt owned to, owed to Jews that's passed on to the heirs of the original borrower for the duration of the child's life as a minor, you can't collect the debt. And even when the child reaches adulthood, you can no longer collect, you can't collect any interest. And that's, of course, only for the Jews. Jews were forced to wear distinctive badges. This appears all across Europe. Uh, In England, they had to wear yellow tablets. Why is it always yellow? Because, of course, Jews, they're all greedy. All they care about is gold. So what color are you going to assign them? You give them yellow. Uh, In England, they were forced to wear little yellow tablets, little luchos, (laughs) Uh, as a way of distinguishing themselves. Um, harsh taxes were levied upon the Jewish moneylenders when they couldn't pay it. They initially were accused of disloyalty. The right to lend was abolished. Their movements were restricted. Uh, in, tw- in 1276, 300 heads of Jewish household were brought to the Tower of England, still standing, and were executed. Others were killed in their homes. In 1290, first they took 269 Jews and hunged them, and the rest of the Jews, approximately around 16,000 Jews, 
were expelled, when you expel the Jews, what do you do? You take the property, you take the possessions, and it's yours. What are they? They can't do anything about that. And this is going to be the first general expulsion of Jews in Europe. And it's indeed interesting. Until 1655, the middle of the 17th century, Jews were not allowed to live in Europe. Uh, in, in, sorry, in England. It's an astonishing 350 years, 360 whatever years, Jews were not allowed to live there. So Shakespeare, uh, somehow the anti-Semitism managed, managed to trickle into his writing and his attitudes, despite the fact that, in all likelihood, he never saw a single Jew in his life. Where do the Jews go? They go to France. France is, of course, the place of refuge, right? Absolutely not, of course. Uh, so what? Let, let's talk about France a little bit. In France, in the year 1181, uh, randomly, the king once decided, I'm going to just arrest all the Jews, take all their money, with no warning. In 1182, he had his initial expulsion, but that didn't last for that long. After a little bit, their economy tanked, and 16 years later, he welcomes the Jews back. And in France in the 1240s, the famous episode of the disputation, we'll get to it in a little bit, regarding the Talmud, they take 24 wagons full of Talmud and burn him in the public square in Paris. In 1269, all Jews were forced to wear a distinctive and derogatory badge. And of course, in 1306, the king, King Philip the Fair, very fair, of course, uh, he was broke. What happens when you're broke and you're a medieval king who has a significant population of Jews living in your jurisdiction? You banish them. You banish them and take forcible possession of all their property, uh, real and personal. And that didn't last, of course, because this is the pattern. It happened in France again and again. You take the Jews out, your economy tanks, because they're the ones who know what to do finance. And in the year 1315, uh, the Jews are invited back for only a period of, like, a trial period of 12 years, and that's the way it continued. They, they're invited back, and they kicked out, and back, and they kicked out. And that is the, the sad story of Jews living in France in the early part of the most recent millennium. What about Germany? In 1241, the Jews of Frankfurt were all killed. The same fate happened to the Jews of Munich in 1285. In 1287, there was a famous episode of another blood libel in Germany. A kid was killed, blamed on the Jews, and 500 Jews were killed in revenge. And it had a series of blood libels that, that ensued. But nothing paralleled the Rheinfleisch massacres of the 1290s. Uh, in 1215... In the Fourth Lateran Council, they developed an idea called the transubstantiation. Essentially, to take food consumed in a church and declare upon it that these crackers are actually the body of J.C. and the wine is the blood of J.C. That was their idea. Um, I guess it was a fundraising ploy of some sorts. But either way, the Jews of Rottingen were accused of desecrating your consecrated host. They, they were torturing these little wafers and wine and to, to continue their torture of J.C. 1,200 years prior. So there was this individual by the name of Reinfleisch who apparently had debts to the Jews and he declared that he received a mandate from heaven to go and avenge this terrible sacrilege of the Jews, kill them all. And he, on April 20th of 1298, uh, incidentally also the birthday of Hitler many years later, he took all the Jews of Rottingen and burned them on the stake along with his frenzied mob. And he continued throughout Bavaria, throughout Austria, and he ultimately killed about 100,000 Jews and ravaged more than a hundred Jewish communities. And this is just striking because most people don't even know about this. That in the end of the 13th, early 14th century, there was such heinous, horrific mass murder perpetrated by Christians against Jews. It's unfathomable. And the numbers are staggering. Um, in Nuremberg, for example, 
where the Jews were trying to hide from this mob, and they went into this fortress. You can still go visit it today. And there were some Christians that were trying to help defend them. But this mob, this Rheinfleisch mob, they overcame the defenders, butchered everyone, including one of the great commentators of the Talmud, Mordechai ben Hillel, who wrote the famous Mordechai commentary of Talmud. The only communities that survived this massacre were those in Regensburg and Augsburg, who were protected by the local city. Now, these expulsions uh, continued in Hungary in 1349 and in 1360 in Austria, in 1421, in Lithuania, in 1445, and in 1495, of course, very famously, in Spain, in 1492. Uh, Jews had lived in Spain under relatively peaceful conditions for 600 years. It had a period of known as the Golden Age of Spain. In 1492, they were given the option, you either convert to Christianity or leave, or we'll kill you. Either one, pick your poison. And essentially 250,000 Jews had to flee. Uh, roughly the same amount of <coughs> Jews decided to stay and convert to Christianity. Many of them did that just on the surface, but really were secretly practicing Jewry. Uh, it's estimated that of the people leaving, these masses of Jews with their families having to leave to flee, to where are you going? Uh, it's estimated that 25,000 actually died in this journey to leave and to flee Spain. Those that stayed, they were subject to the Inquisition. The Inquisition was founded in the 1230s and it essentially lasted until the 1830s. It was around for 500 years and its objective was to root out the fake Christians. It wasn't actually against the Jews. That's a mis, uh, that's a, uh, that's a common misconception, that it was there to target the Jews. The truth is it was there to target the secret Jews, the Moranos, people that professed to be Christians but weren't really so. And of course, over the course of the ensuing hundreds of years, many, many Jews were persecuted uh, for secretly being Jews with horrific ways. Uh, they were tortured. They were publicly burned in these massive autos de fe, these acts of faith. And the Jews that had fled had to find new homes elsewhere in Turkey, North Africa, and Italy. Those are, of course, the Sephardic Jews that we have today. Sephardic is from Spain. Those are the Jews that had to flee. Uh, in Portugal, in just a couple of years later, in 1496, the king of Portugal, he wanted to marry the daughter of Isabella, the Spanish monarch. As a condition of their marriage, he had to agree to expel his Jews uh, ultimately, they didn't expel them, but they did do forced conversions. They didn't expel all of them. They did forced conversions on many. The chief rabbi of Portugal at the time, he refused to convert. And in classic medieval Christian and Semitic fashion, they buried him in earth up to his neck, and they just allowed him to die of thirst and starvation, which he did after seven days. Now, there was another strain of, of anti-Semitism in this time, and that is Jews are vilified and Jews are scapegoated. Anything that goes wrong, you can blame on the Jews. And this is manifest more than any other instance in the Black Plague that swept through Europe in the 14th century. Now, our best estimates of how many people died is around 25 million people over the course of half a century. But essentially, you look at the latter half of the 14th century, tremendous regression and stagnation because there's this plague that's just killing everyone, and indiscriminately, apparently. Now, the Jews died at a lesser rate than everyone else, and that is easily attributed in hindsight to the sanitary conditions that the Jews needed to maintain Jewish life. If you want to eat food as a Jew, you have to wash your hands. You have to wash your hands in the morning, after you go to the bathroom, you have to live in a clean environment, you have to bathe before every Shabbos. You want to say a blessing, you can't say any blessing next to corpses or next to a refuse or waste. You have, to you have to live in a more clean, sanitary, hygienic environment, and that saved them from 
the fleas that uh, carried the virus, and thus they died at lower rates. But to the Christians, they see more Christians dying than Jews. Naturally, the only solution, don't talk to me about bacteria all that. What is that even? Nonsense, right? The, don't talk to me about that. The, the, re, the reason is the Jews obviously poison the wells. Just to make sure, we have to just torture a few people to admit it, as we've perfected. And they tried to stop it. They put guards across all the wells to stop the Jews. And of course, it continued. But it didn't stop them. So if it wasn't the wells, it was something else. The Jews are thinking about it. They're praying about it. Regardless, scores of Jewish communities were massacred in cold blood as a result of, of this nonsense. Jews are responsible for everything. There's another kind of, of anti-Semitism that reared its ugly head in medieval times, and that is religious anti-Semitism. Jews were subject to forced baptism. They were subject to forced sermons. They were forced to listen to sermons on Christianity bashing Judaism. Uh, and of course, Jews were, Jews were subject to book censorship and book burning. Famously in France, we already mentioned this a little bit earlier, in 1230, there was a Jew by the name of, by the name of Nicholas Donin, who he went awry and he was kicked out of the Jewish community and he went on to besmirch and denounce the Talmud as anti-Christian in front of the Pope. And he argued, let's have a band. And the Pope liked that idea, and he issued a ban. And in Paris, the rabbis were forced to debate with this individual, with this Nicholas Dunin, regarding his claims that the Talmud is anti-Christian. Now, I would surmise the Talmud is anti-Christian because we, the Talmud doesn't believe in the divinity or the messianic credentials of J.C., in the notion of Christian uh, the Christian notion of virgin birth, uh, but the rabbis were not allowed to speak freely. They were not allowed to defend their position. Certainly, they were not allowed to make counterclaims. And of course, under such conditions, you can't possibly win any debate. And they lost. And thus, the Talmud was labeled as antagonistic to Christianity. And they gathered all the Talmuds, so handwritten manuscripts from all of France, and they burned in the public square in Paris, essentially ending the Torah dominance of France. And King Louis the Ninth, for his efforts, was beatified. And thus we have St. Louis and St. Louis, Missouri, etc. In Barcelona, in Spain, in 1263, famous event, the Disputation of Barcelona. And this was unique throughout this time period because Jews were allowed to speak freely, provided, of course, they don't say anything objectionable against Christianity. But the Ramban, famous Ramban, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman, the leader of Spanish Jewry, uh, he was representing the Jews against Pablo Christianity, who was a, a Jew who had converted to Christianity. And the objective of these disputations was to prove the veracity of Christianity from the Jewish writings themselves, from the Tanakh and the Talmud. And the church was so convinced that they're going to have this imminent victory and there's going to be these swarms of Jews to baptize. And of course, the exact opposite happened. The Ramban freed from the constraints that held previous debaters behind. He trounced them over four days. In fact, he wrote a book called Sefer Vikuach, the book of the disputation, where he wrote essentially the minutes of these uh, of these debates, and it was a clear and a convincing and a final refutation of Christianity that it was indeed used throughout the generations. He would argue, for example, well, J.C. was a Jew, and his contemporaries rejected him. Well, if they rejected him, why should we accept them? Uh, he brought voluminous biblical textual evidence that we're not living amidst the messianic age and indeed after the debate was concluded the king declared and this is written in Ramban Ramban writes this himself the king declared I have never seen a man so wrong argue his case so well and he gave him 
300 gold coins. But of course, that Shabbos, the king came to the shul and he gave a lecture to the Jews while they only converted to Christianity. Sometimes evidence is not enough. Apparently that's uh, true here as well. The Ramban responded why it's so absurd to convert to Christianity. Ultimately, he was pressured to flee. He had to flee and he, he left and he actually died in Israel. In 1553, in Italy, thanks to Pope Julius III, all the copies of the Talmud were confiscated. They went to house-to-house search and they burned him in a huge fire in Rosh Hashanah. Today in the Piazza Navona in Rome, there's a plaque commemorating this event that has the words of the Talmud in Avodah Zarah, page, nine, uh, page 18, famous words of Reb Hanina ben Shradio when he was burned with a Torah scroll, that the scrolls are being burned, but the letters are flying up to heaven. Now, there is a myth about Christian anti-Semitism that the church leaders and the Pope and all those people, they were really trying to stop it with everything they had. It was just the rabble-rousers, the whippersnappers, the ones who, who were trying to get the frenzied mobs to do things. Those were the real causes for the anti-Semitism. So this is, an, this is a, a whitewashing of history. It is revisionist. It's just not true. And indeed, there is evidence that it's not true. The church it's themselves, they were not only complicit but they were, in fact, the primary cause of this Jewish hatred. I want to just go through a list here. There's the official position of the Pope would be written down in these papal bulls. And we have a list here of anti-Jewish papal bulls, official stances from the Pope. I want to run through a few of them here. This is, uh, this is like a small, small fraction of the whole list. So, for example... In 1205, a papal bull declared Jews are not allowed to eat together with Christians. In 1228, all the debt of the Crusaders owned, owed to the Jews, they, all the interest was canceled, and they were granted a moratorium on when they could actually pay back the principal. 1244, Talmud should be burned. Uh, 1278, conversion ceremonies for Jews, or sermons, conversion sermons for Jews. 1423, renews the law requiring Jews to wear badges. 1442, all testimony of Jews against Christians is invalid. Uh, 1555, establishing a ghetto. Uh, Jews are not allowed to practice only unskilled jobs. They could be secondhand dealers. They could be fishmongers, but they can't be pawnbrokers or uh, be moneylenders. 1584, 150 Jews have to attend weekly conversion ser- sermons and on and on and on. Indeed, I think one thing's clear in part one, uh, that unprecedented hatred of Jews resulting from the Christian anti-Semitism uh, is clearly on display throughout history. It's not something that's so much fun to talk about now, uh, because thankfully we don't live in those times, uh, even though... A student of history knows that the one constant is anti-Semitism. The degree of how much it's manifest depends uh, upon the time and the era and the place. Uh, In fact, in the United States today, there's more hate crimes perpetrated against Jews than any other minority group. Even today, in the United States. Uh, Of course, things are a lot better, thankfully. But it's clear that the notion that Christianity is a religion of love is contradicted by facts, and it's contradicted by history. Our nation has suffered tremendously by acts of hatred uh, from these people, and I think it's important for us, as we study Jewish history, to learn about these stories and to maybe try to see what the lesson is. Now, next week, we're going to talk about the most recent 500 years of Christian anti-Semitism. The Jews, of course, are going to migrate uh, away from Portugal and Spain to places like Poland and the Ukraine, eventually Russia and Italy. There's going to be the Protestant Reformation. It's going to change the role of the church and the power and authority of the church. And, of course, the most 
reprehensible genocide in all of human history has its roots in a thousand years of Christian anti-Semitism.